Join me, 48 Hours Correspondent Erin Moriarty, on my podcast, My Life of Crime, as I take on true crime investigations like no other. This season, I'm looking into the labyrinth of crime and secrets within families. I'm cutting straight to the evidence and talking to the people directly involved, including investigators and the families of victims. Listen to My Life of Crime with Aaron Moriarty wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by JLL. Get an insider view into the world of commercial real estate with JLL's podcast, Trends and Insights, the Future of Commercial Real Estate. Whether you're curious about making cities more sustainable, the evolution of office space, or AI opportunities, this podcast will help keep you a step ahead. Tune in for candid conversations with business leaders about the biggest trends impacting how we live, work, and play. Subscribe to Trends and Insights now at jll.com slash podcast. This is a Rogue Media Network podcast. This is Central Texas Life with Ann Harder. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Central Texas Life. Now, this is a first for me. I'm doing an interview with a published author... And she writes under a nom de plume, which is her pen name. And uh, we're not going to reference your real life name. No. That's what I was told <laughs> by a mutual friend. Yes, we're going to set this up. We're going to keep it a secret today. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to keep it a secret today because Percy J has uh, got her first book out. It's called The Bride of a Leicester. And it is fun. This is, this is called... <laughs> This is called romantic fantasy, and it is, I have to admit, it's, it's a subgenre yes. of fantasy fiction, and I, it's just not something I normally read. But as a kid, I always loved fairy tales. Mm-hmm. I mean, I loved fairy tales. And so that's kind of what you've written. Yes, it is. It is very much a fairy tale-inspired story. And I wanted to take some of those fairy tale tropes and classic fantasy tropes that we all grew up with and say, what happens if we added a little bit of real world logic into this? If we had like the Conan the Barbarian character and we made him this big tough warrior, what would real life consequences of having those kinds of qualities be? You know, if you're if you're a woman in a high fantasy setting and you don't have a whole lot of choices, how would that make you feel? So I took those concepts and just kind of ran with them, and this is how I ended up with it. Well, and it is a page turner, I have to say. I mean, it was really a lot of fun. It was a fun read, um, The Bride of Leicester, and got to the end, and ah, we have a cliffhanger. <laughs> and if I had read the inside cover carefully, it says, this is the first in the Leicester <laughs> series. So you have more. I do have more. I currently have the second book, The Sorceress of Leicester. It is almost completely oh. drafted. Three-fourths of it is currently with my editor right now, and we are looking at a spring 2024 release date. That's coming right up. It is coming right up. Well, okay. So let's let's get into it. Um, now, you know, in, in talking about this subgenre, uh, it says one of the key features of romantic fantasy involves a focus on relationships, social, political, romantic. Yes. Very, and you ca- and you have all those bases covered. Romantic fantasy has been published by both fantasy lines and romance lines. So, um, it's it's got a definite love story, with a pretty major, mm-hmm. shall we say, a big twist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You have to read it. It's a beautiful play on words. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, sort of. Um, But so, so what intrigued you about that particular aspect, the romance part of it? Well, it first started out as a love story, first and foremost. The very fledgling concept of The Bride of Lycaster started because Beauty and the Beast is my favorite love story. And so I asked myself, what if I had a Beauty and the Beast style story, but instead of making the beast an animal, I just made him way too big and specifically nine and a half feet tall. A giant. A a giant. And so how would that work with a very petite woman? I mean, you can, you can do the math in your head. The math does not math. That's not going to work. Well, and you have, and you actually have, um, 
little cards. You, you even did a little, and I know you can't see it from here, <laughs> but you have sort of the perspective of our heroine, Serafina, yes. uh, sitting on Rand's yes. knee. And yeah, and so it's, yeah, she's he, tiny. The, the like, proportion. She's like a little munchkin on his lap. Yeah, I had an artist commission that scene because I wanted people to visualize exactly what the central conflict is, that they are not the right size for mm -hmm. each other. And some people will look at the art and say, why is she so small? It's like, oh, no, it's not that she's small. It's he's nine and a half feet tall. And people can't really conceptualize how large that is because people that large don't really exist. But when they see it, you instantly go, oh, this is a problem. Yeah. Occasionally <laughs> you'll see a basketball player that's seven feet. Yes. Maybe seven plus. I mean, that's that's pretty tall. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a major human mm -hmm. being. But you're adding another couple of feet on yeah. that. Um, of course, you know, in fairy tales and so forth, giants are fearsome, you know, fee fi fo fum. Yes. I smell the blood of an English, <laughs> but, you know, and they eat people. Yes. So uh, that kind of figures... There are those kinds of creatures in your in your book. Yes, I do have giants in the book. They are immediately introduced as these very fearsome creatures. Um, and I don't think it's too spoilery to say that they end up causing the death of Serafina's older brothers because they do fee fi fo eat them. And that's the catalyst of all of the conflict in the book. And so whenever Serafina ends up being forced to marry a, an alleged half giant, she has a lot of angry feelings about that, and that also drives right. the conflict. Right, right. Con conflicted on her her grief, her ongoing grief with the loss of her of her brothers. But yeah, you mention you know in trying to conceptualize this uh, this character as being someone you know in an archaic age. Yes. Uh, where the young ladies are schooled in a separate mm -hmm. school, and they're kind of brought up for what they're going to become, and they really have no no choices. No, none whatsoever. And they're they're quite angry about that. And my different female characters take that anger and use it in different ways. Serafina takes that anger and it's very low burning and it drives her motivation to manipulate and to lie and to connive her way just to get a crumb of safety. Then you have other characters like Brietta where she takes that anger and she stays quiet, she reads, she tries not to make too big of a fuss. And then there's Annalisa who lashes out and she's a bully and she <laughs> she will, if she's upset about something, she will tell you about it. Yeah, she's kind of a wench. <laughs> she is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, they, they kind of form these alliances. And, uh, yeah, and of course, you know, again, I don't know how, how much detail we want to get into, you know, on this podcast about, about the book. But the storyline is uh, that they, they reach the age of marrying. Yes. And so they're just like cattle at an auction. That's exactly what it is, yes. <laughs> and, and they don't know who they're going to end up with. It's, you know, of course, there are game shows on TV, you know, about, you know, love at first sight. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> All these kinds of crazy shows that we see now that's, you know, in a way, I don't know, The Bachelor, Bachelor, that's been around for years, you know, but it's the same kind of idea that, that you're sort of competing, you know, for somebody. Yes. But in this case, the, the young ladies, they, they have no choice. They just end up with whoever they end up with. That's right. There's a lot of magic yes. involved in this, too. Let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. So whereas the magic is concerned, it's very folklore based. I did take a lot of inspiration from Norse mythology with my magic. I took a lot of inspiration from Greek mythology with the concept of my magic. And the magic is, at least in book one, a metaphor for human phenomena such as post-traumatic stress disorder. Hmm. The way the magic is, um, per the way it manifests in the main love interest Rian and why he's so large is that he is a soldier. He went to war and he came back and he doesn't know how to deal with those feelings. And the way he describes it in the book is that his body betrays him when he's afraid. And so he gets bigger. Right. It's so, in a way, a little bit like the incredible Hulk. Yes. Where he would be kind of normal or well, he, he's never like normal cause he's tall, but he can get bigger. Yes. When that anger or, you know, like the adrenaline or whatever causes these changes in him. Mm -hmm. There's really not any way he can, you know, 
tap the brakes on that? Or? No, there's no way he can stop it. And much like in real life, whenever someone has post-traumatic stress disorder and they can turn into a monster metaphorically, Rian Bloodstone turns into a monster literally. And he just keeps getting bigger and more fearsome. And he lives a life where he's incredibly uncomfortable in his body and it ends up making him very isolationist. And he doesn't have relationships and he doesn't have friends. And it's a very sad thing. So you see him at first as this fearsome monster and a great warrior and how awesome it must be to be him. And then the more you learn about him, the more you realize this man is absolutely miserable. And yeah. it's quite sad. And he would <laughs> like to love someone. He yes. would like to have a, but who, you know, who? Who could when ever learn to love a monster? Big, you know, that's yeah. the problem. Um, but yeah, so let, let's, let's delve a little bit more into Miss Serafina. Yes. She's a... She's a very complicated character. She is. And people are 50-50 on whether they like her or they dislike her. It's, she's, it's, a, it's a schism <laughs> amongst my readers. Yeah. Um, she is, obviously, I mean, it's her, it's her voice, pretty much, that we're, that we're hearing. And so everything is kind of filtered through what she's thinking. But she's pretty honest about her, her own scheming. And, and she kind of lies to herself. She does. In, in think. oh, well, you know, no, I really, you know, I, this is what I want to happen. And then, then she can kind of can become conflicted as more information is revealed to her. Yes. Something that I really wanted to do with her character is utilize the concept of an unreliable narrator. Because we in first person perspective and we see her internal monologue, I wanted her to be such a good liar that she not only lies to herself within her own internal monologue, she lies to the reader about what's happening. So you can see some clues in the text how something is described, but her internal monologue will tell the reader something that's clearly the opposite and not at all true. <laughs> TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, streaming January 25th, only on Netflix. You say you, you drew on Norse mythology, Greek mythology, um, and you, you loved this kind of style of, of story and storytelling as a kid. Did, you had a favorite, but what are some of the other uh, fairy tales or, or, or things that you kind of feel like you drew on for, for writing this series? Well, I'm definitely a huge Disney fan. Uh -huh. I was the kid who grew up in the 90s with the Masterpiece Collection on VHS, and so I would watch those movies over and over and yeah. over. And as I got older, I wouldn't just watch it for the story or for the characters or the songs. I started watching it to see how these stories are constructed. Take the story of Snow White, for example. Snow White, the first animated movie feature length ever right. to ever exist, yeah. um, it focuses a lot on an emotional journey rather than necessarily a logic-driven plot. And so it takes you through these really rough moments. Like if you can remember, they're in the woods. It's very scary. She's going through all of this torment and torture. And we even get to a funeral of a Disney princess at the end. Yeah. That's incomprehensible to think of today. But because you go through all that strife and all that pain, that happy ending in contrast is luminescent with how happy it is. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to take that concept of we're going to put you through heck because that happy ending at the end is going to be so sweet because of it. So I just took all of these concepts of storytelling and of character building from classics we love, like from Disney, 
And that's what I really drew my inspiration from. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're hearing and seeing, you know, how Disney, you know, they're, they're kind of getting off into some weird stuff. Now. Yeah. <laughs> really. And, it, and it's like almost like go back to your roots and t- retell these stories. You know, and so I, I don't know. It's it's exciting though to see uh, what you you come up with this now. All you know, cards on the table, as it were. You've got other I, cards we can look at. Um, it's a little spicy. It is a little spicy, just a little bit. <laughs> well, there, you know, there's a few f bombs in there, and there, you know, there's some yes. language. I'll put it that way. So definitely. Um, you know, not for your preteen. No, it's not for preteens. I actually have a page right in the front where I inform any potential readers that this story is for audiences 18 and up. And I do inform the reader what the contents of the book are. I think that's very important, not just for parents of potential readers, but also for readers themselves. Because I do get into some dark themes that some people just might not want to read, not, might not be pleasant for them. Yeah, and my, just might not be the best thing for a younger reader for sure um i I do like to talk to authors though about their process um without saying too much more about your personal life i mean there is a (laughs) child involved yes (laughs) (laughs) and so how do you you know how do you how do you personally find the time to have a career as a professional Mm -hmm. person and and uh and do this too this is not this is not your only job right so i do have a normal job i do have a normal eight to five And what I do is I will go to my job, I will come home, I will be mom, and all that time I'm marketing on my social media, I write at night, and I work until usually about 1 a.m. every night. Mm -hmm. Every night, there are no days off. My weekends are completely consumed with working, and because I self-publish the book, I not only write the book myself, I also do the majority of the editing myself, I have to find my cover artist myself, I have to find my artist myself, I do all of the internal art myself, I draw my art myself, I even made my own font for this book, so I, I like did. It. <laughs> Thank you. A lot, yeah, and I have to say, <laughs> I haven't found any typos, I haven't found any misspelled words, <laughs> and I, you know, I was kind of the grammar mom in the newsroom, yes. you know? and, um, and I, you know, I have had people on where, you know, there have been a few things that slipped through the cracks, you know, but I've not found any, so kudos well, thank to you, you <laughs> for doing all that yourself. I was a magazine editor in college. I went uh-huh. to Oklahoma State University for my undergrad, and it was drilled into me to do multiple passes, to have that editor's eagle eye, and to not send something to print unless it is perfect. Now, you will always find something after it's gone to print. Yeah. I know I did whenever I had like thousands, not thousands, but thousands of passes over my magazine. I still found one typo. That'd be, yeah. And How there, did you get through? <laughs> it, you? Perseverance. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it was just a point where I, I could not give up because I knew it was going to get done. I did not see a scenario where it didn't get done, and I just did it. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I mean, I just think, think it's remarkable, and, I, and I'm so proud of you for doing that. And what I, what I like is that at the end, you've got discussion questions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think that's pretty cool. Um, you know, you, 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 a lot of them related to the heroine of the yes. book. Uh, Serafina, and you know, how, you know, well, why do you think you know? So, have you been hearing from uh, book clubs? I mean, have people been using your book, or do you, you know how? How do you get feedback I, on who's reading? I did book? have an appearance on an online book club last week, and that was a lot of fun. They didn't Good. necessarily follow the discussion questions, but people like discussing the characters. Yeah, um, I have not had any. Of like book clubs reach out to me and say, hey, we want to do your book. Can you have an appearance? I do know that um, Blackbird Books and Spirits in Belton has been wanting to do book clubs. And if anyone's listening and if you want to do a book club, I am more than happy to <laughs> be yeah. of assistance. I please do. I think it's wonderful. Um, I really intentionally made The Bride of Lycaster something for people to discuss, whether it's the theme or the story, or whether people kind of choose their favorite character and argue on their behalf over why they did nothing wrong and everyone else is wrong. Yeah. And I, I, I did that on purpose. Everyone's going to find something they like or relate to in this book. Well, oh, absolutely. You know, I, I believe that is true. So you've got the second one, The Sorceress. Yes, The Sorceress of Lycaster. And so what's, do you know, what's the third? I mean, what do you have? Is it going to be a trilogy? Is it going to be six books? I, I, do you even have an idea in your head? I, and that's the other thing. 
I just don't know how you come up with this stuff. I mean, how you how you conceive of the characters and the storyline. I mean, I just think it's awesome that you've been able to do that. Well, in terms of coming up with the story, what would happen is I had the fledgling idea for The Bride of Lycaster, and I'd been wanting to write for a long time, ever since I was 12. And I came up with an idea, and I tried to write it, and I never was able to write more than a few pages. I didn't know what was wrong with me that I couldn't finish it. And then whenever I was driving around for work, I would entertain myself on these long drives by watching scenes of The Bride of Lycaster like a movie in my head. Playing it in your head. And so for nine months, I just watched it while I was running or driving or doing anything mundane, just entertaining myself in my mind. And then one day, it was a Saturday morning in April of 2022, I just opened up a Word document and I said, okay, let's do this. And then I, I wrote it. I wrote the first draft of The Bride of Lycaster in two months. Did you really? It, it took me two months. And it's the first draft was 90,000 words. So it was it was, it was was pretty big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so, so did you have a, an outline in your head when you started or did it evolve as you're writing? Oh, it evolved completely. Okay. Um, the, the, the story that went to print is completely different. Well, I shouldn't say completely different. The heart's still the same, but it is very different from my first draft. Yeah. A lot of the characters evolved. My motivations evolved. As I evolved as a storyteller and mm -hmm. as I got to know my characters better, I just kind of let them lead the story. And that's where I found like these really good moments. I was like, ah, I, I now understand you. I now understand why you're doing the things that you're doing. And I think people are really going to enjoy this story now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's just, I, I love hearing the process. I mean, I just think it's, it's fascinating. Um, how you go about doing that. And you say you self published. I did. <clears throat> so what all was involved with that? I mean, so I, mean, I this is a great, you know, basically yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a very nice book. I did want, and there is, there are a thousand different ways to self publish. Some people go through Amazon. Some people go through a, a printing service where they print the book and then sell it through themselves. I went through a publisher called Ingram Spark and Ingram, the bookseller is where most booksellers get copies of any book from, whether it's published by a large publisher, a small publisher or an independent publisher, they get it from that site. And so what I did was I provided Ingram Spark with the file. So I formatted it, everything myself. I delivered them the cover myself and they put it together and they distribute it to places like Barnes and Noble and Amazon and pretty much anywhere books are sold. I'm in Walmart, I'm in Target, they do all the distribution, I just gave them the file. Well, that's awesome. I mean, that, that really is great. Um, very cool. Well, nearing the end of this, and I like to end these visits with a little questionnaire <laughs> similar to the one that the late, great James Lipton would use on Inside the Actor Studio, so this is my take on it. What is your favorite word oh my favorite word I think I've used it already but I love the word luminescent that's a good word as a wordsmith that's excellent <laughs> what's your least favorite word oh my least favorite word I know it's not the f word because you used a lot of them I, the f word's <laughs> in my top 10 favorites I'm not gonna lie <laughs> okay <laughs> oh your least favorite I don't like using a whole lot of adverbs. Mm -hmm. I know that. Probably the word cringe. Yeah. I don't like the word cringe. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, what turns you on creatively, emotionally, spiritually? What turns me on creatively? Being alone with my thoughts and being honest with myself. I love chewing on things and ruminating on things and finding out the why and the how. And when I get that raw feeling of why and the how, I like to take it into something tangible and put it into words for people to understand. That's where my creativity comes from. Good. What turns you off, conversely, creatively or spiritually or emotionally? Something that I really don't like to write in my books is violence or gore. I don't have a lot of it. I don't really like blood and guts and decapitation, which is odd because it's fantasy. People right. expect that going have, in. You know, you had plenty of opportunity. You could have. Yeah. You could have done that. I don't like reading it, so that's I'm good with you on that. <laughs> um, what sound do you love the most? I love 
the sound of hearing people's voices when they tell me what they love about the story. It's that little lilt in their pitch when you can tell they are really happy or inspired or moved by something. And it fills my soul in a way that I did not think was possible. Hmm. What sound do you hate? I figured that was coming. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a sound that I hate. Yeah. Other than just the normal nails on a chalkboard. Yeah. 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 That's a bad one. <laughs> I don't like negativity. I right. don't like when I can tell people are just trying to drag somebody down mm. because that's not that's not the life I'm trying to live as an author. Right. I believe in supporting each other, not competing. Okay. Um, okay. We never said what your profession is. But, <laughs> but what, what other profession would you like, besides being a, a book writer, what, what other profession would you like to have tried? I would have loved to have been on film more often or be a voice actor. Oh, I loved the world. You could do that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I loved the world of acting. I love being a performer. And so here I am yeah, doing something I love at this well, moment. Yeah, and storytelling. I mean, creating, yes. creating these stories. Um, what job do you know you would not want to do? No, thank you very much. Don't want to do that. And I say this with absolutely all the love and respect in my heart, but I do not know how teachers do it. <laughs> My parents are teachers. Every teacher in my, everyone in my family is a teacher. I come from a long line of teachers. I do not know how y'all do it. God bless every single one of you. Yeah, You're in my heart and mind constantly. Yeah, that's, that's mine too. That's mm -hmm. mine too. Um, and finally, what do you want to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Good job. That's what we all hope for. Yes. <laughs> Percy J., you are a treasure. I mean, this is so much fun. The Bride of Leicester. And so I'm ready to read The uh, Sorceress of Leicester when that comes out. And you know, we'll have to come. Yeah, I'm working hard. Back. You're working hard on it. And I have you back. To, uh, to talk about it as well. So how can folks, you say it's available in a lot of places, but is there, you know, Amazon, just an easy way to, to get a copy of the book? Yes, you can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Walmart, anywhere you can find books in the normal large places. You can also get a signed copy from me at percyjauthor.com. I'll throw in my character cards, some art, some bookmarks, maybe a sticker or two if I'm feeling like it. <laughs> but I always give free goodies if you order from my website. Oh, well, that is cool. Yes. That's very good. And, I, and I've got this copy. I'm hoping you will sign it before you leave. Oh, of that, course. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I appreciate you so much. Thank you. All right, thank for you for having me on. I, I love talking. I just love hearing from authors. And <laughs> this is a totally new subgenre <laughs> for me, uh, romantic fantasy. So uh, The Bride of Leicester. And we'll see you again next time. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Central Texas Life with Ann Harder is part of the Rogue Media family. Be sure to check out our other shows at roguemedianetwork.com. Please rate this show five stars on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Join us again soon for more Central Texas Life with Ann Harder. This has been a Rogue Media Network 